This video is sponsored by Raycon. Whether you're out and about or staying inside, Raycon's Everyday Earbuds have you covered. I've been using the Everyday Earbuds for years now, and one thing I really love about them is the ability to either isolate noise and drown the world out, or have them in awareness mode so that I can listen while keeping up with what's going on around me. They're also sweat and water resistant, so what this all means is that I can go for my daily walks and sweat like crazy in the summer heat without worrying about my earbuds failing, all while being able to still take note of my surroundings and go into complete immersion mode once it's time for work. Work. If you'd rather not chance it in the heat, then use the everyday earbuds while working out inside, doing homework, or winding down. Either way, on top of the aforementioned noise isolating fit, you'll also enjoy seamless Bluetooth pairing that isn't overly complicated, a variety of colors, 32 hour battery life with 8 hours continuous playtime, optimized gel tips, and even better, they start at about half the price of other premium brands without sacrificing quality. I could go on, but to me it's pretty clear why Raycon has over 50,000 5 star reviews. If you'd like to get yourself a little something while supporting independent online content, then head over to buyraycon.com slash rainbot to get 15% off your first pair. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash rainbot. For children in care systems around the world, adoption is basically the dream. When it goes right, getting adopted offers stability where there once was none, and grants a child a home life comparable to any other kid their age. Now, when adults have bad intentions and safeguards fail, however, things can go horribly wrong very quickly. This was unfortunately the case for Jung In, a baby not yet old enough to speak, whose story would shake the entire nation of South Korea. Because of local laws, Jung In's adoptive parents have only been publicly identified by their last names, that being Jung, the mother, and An, the father. On the face of it, the couple appear to be the ideal adoptive parents. They already had a four-year-old biological daughter and, according to their friends, had been passionate about adopting a child even before their first had arrived. They seemed to be so suited for the task, in fact, that the two of them were even featured in a Korea educational broadcast system documentary called An Ordinary Family, a film intended to actually promote adoption. In spite of outward appearances, however, it did not take long for Jung In's new life to become nothing short of a complete nightmare. In the investigation that was to come, police would conclude that her abuse began in February, just one month after her adoption. This went unnoticed, or at least unreported, until several months later. On May 25th of 2020, a worker at the little girl's daycare would be the first to sound the alarm. They reported suspected abuse to the authorities after finding bruises on the baby's stomach and thighs. What was their excuse for all this? Well, Jung In apparently had a condition that caused her legs to be slightly deformed, and the adoptive parents claimed that the bruises had probably come as the result of massages that were meant to correct this condition. That, of course, does not cover the bruises not located on her legs, but nonetheless, nothing significant came from this development. The next warning sign came not long after, on June 29th when it was reported to police that Jung In had been left alone inside a parked car. Keep in mind, this is during the summer. In the end, the authorities would fail to find any evidence of neglect, though that's hardly surprising given that, according to the Granite Tower, the police didn't even begin investigating this until around a month after the report, and by that point, things, of course, had fizzled out. Now, in July, Jung-in had stopped attending daycare and wouldn't return for a full two months. Though the workers had already shown concern about her welfare due to the aforementioned bruises, they did feel that, independent of this, she appeared to be a happy and healthy child overall. Staff reported that following her absence, the baby would now frequently have bruises, that her complexion had changed, and that she was very clearly underweight. Text messages between her adoptive parents recovered later in the investigation would expose the fact that the choice to starve her was not only deliberate, but malicious. By September 23rd, someone at the daycare felt so troubled by everything that was going on that they decided to take the situation into their own hands by bringing Jung In to a hospital. The doctor who examined her recognized the red flags, thankfully, and filed a report of suspected child abuse in which they strongly advised that the girl be removed from her parents. In response to this, the police requested that the couple submit a more extensive examination of the child. Zhang and An would of course fulfill this request, but by getting the results of this examination from a doctor they already knew. 
Said doctor would conclude that the injuries he witnessed were the result of stomatitis. Now, stomatitis means an inflammation or sores of the mouth, which obviously does not account for much of what was wrong with Jung In, but does lend credence to the unconfirmed rumors that the child was deliberately fed things that were too hot to be consumed. The second doctor, whose exact personal relationship with the abusive pair is unclear, would later go on to say that he was unaware of the abuse allegations when he had seen the girl as a patient. This defense, of course, does little because all it proves is that he's either a liar or very awful at his job. Now, despite all this, based on his questionable report, the authorities would once again disregard the obvious signs of mistreatment, and by October 12th of 2020, things were looking especially dire. Once again, it was the people at the daycare pushing for something to be done. As a staff member pleaded with the adoptive parents to take Jung into a doctor, having noticed that she could no longer swallow or drink, this caregiver would go on to say, quote, "The day before she died, Jung In looked like she gave up on everything. She didn't eat any of her favorite snacks, nor played with her favorite toys." On October 13th, the following day, Jung In's condition became critical. Her mother took a taxi, presumably to the hospital, and actually had to be persuaded by the cab driver to call an ambulance instead. Once there, the infant would suffer three cardiac arrests in the care of medical professionals, who were unfortunately, ultimately, unable to save her. Jung In's life came to an end a mere 271 days after being adopted. Examination on her body would reveal several fractured bones and multiple head wounds. Because of these discoveries, someone working at the hospital would, again, report suspected abuse. According to Korea Jungong Daily, quote, an autopsy by the National Forensic Service found that Jung In died of serious internal bleeding of her organs caused by external force. Now, the type of organ trauma she suffered is almost never seen in cases of accidental injury. The autopsy also revealed evidence of, quote, at least 10 past fractures, which made it clear that the little one had been assaulted repeatedly and over an extended period of time. Also extremely troubling was the child's weight, which was only 8 kilograms at the time of her death. A kilogram less than her weight when she was adopted, in spite of her now being 9 months older. Finally, in November of 2020, the Seoul District Prosecutor's Office proceeded in indicting both parents, Jung for involuntary manslaughter by child abuse and An for negligence. The authorities were taking action, but it was much too little too late for the child they'd failed, and this rightfully disgusted South Korean citizens who were quickly becoming aware of what happened. Before the new year, a petition demanding harsher punishments for child abusers rapidly amassed over 230,000 signatures. In response to this, the government would promise an investigation into Jung In's case, and also promise to reform its prevention of and responses to child abuse. In January of 2021, when the trial began, the situation would gain even more publicity thanks to a report on a show called Unanswered Questions, which aired on SBS. Now, when the Korean people at large learned that the child's abuse had been consistently swept aside, there was an uproar, and a whole lot more attention suddenly aimed at the handling of the case, rather than just on the abuse on its own. The police themselves were heavily scrutinized for their failures, with the public demanding that the officers responsible for mishandling the repeated reports face consequences. At some stage during the trial, Jong would admit to prosecutors that she'd punched Jung In in the stomach when she'd refused to eat, but she denied using, quote, a force that could rupture her organs. She also admitted to shaking the child in the air and then dropping her on the floor the day that she died, with her lawyer stating that, quote, She feels the anger of the public, but she did not mean to kill the girl. She admits that she mistreated the girl on the day she died, but doesn't think what she did killed the child. This does beg the question, what exactly does she think killed her baby, if not her consistent violent abuse? From what we can tell, she's never offered an explanation. As time rolled on, Zhang seemed to accept that she was at the center of a national controversy and told the court that she would, quote, kneel and seek the forgiveness of her deceased daughter, adding that she would, quote, accept any punishment for her crimes. Despite this, she would consistently claim that she didn't step on Jung In or throw her on the floor, in spite of having admitted to dropping her earlier in the trial. This denial came in response to the testimony of one Lee Jung Bin, a professor at Gachin University of Medicine and Science, who stated that the child was likely, quote, stomped on by the defendant. He believed this occurred due to the child's ruptured pancreas and mesentery, which in his opinion were more likely to have been caused by feet rather than fists. Lee would add that he believed the reason Jung assaulted the child with her feet rather than her arms was because at the time, she'd recently received breast surgery. 
In May of 2021, Zhang was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison, which was less than the prosecutor and public wanted, but even this was short-lived. Later that year, on November 26, 2021, her sentence was reduced to 35 years in prison as the court found that there was no intention of committing murder. This is of course a loophole in the child abuse laws of Korea that has been an out for violent guardians for a very long time, since it's almost impossible to prove a deliberate intention to kill when there's been a sustained period of physical abuse preceding the death. As for On, the adoptive father, well he received five years in prison for negligence or aiding in the abuse, depending on who you ask. So how was this terrible thing ever allowed to happen, and why was the abuse able to continue for so long? Well, the truth is that there are so many facets to the failures here that we'd be here all day if we tried to cover each of them in detail. Instead, we'll cover the most egregious as succinctly as we can. Firstly, the adoption agency Holtz Children's Services allegedly rushed the adoption process, allowing the couple that would go on to kill jong in to take custody of her on the day they met her. A 2014 investigation into Holt found that the agency carried out, quote, haphazard inspections according to the Granite Tower, and the agency's own records would also bring to light that they'd been aware of the abuse as early as May of 2020, when the parents had failed to explain jong ins bruises. Instead of taking action, Holt continually allowed the couple to stall, such as in one instance where Holt accepted a request to delay a mandatory home visit. The inaction of the police was also rightly criticized, and while the public and the powers that be are happy to reprimand the specific precinct that handled jung -in's case, when we learn a little more about the core of the problem, it starts to seem likely that any other branch of South Korean law enforcement would have made the same mistakes. Now, why is that? Apparently, if police had chosen to separate Jung In from her adoptive parents, Jung and An could have filed an excessive use of force complaint against those specific officers, which may have threatened their jobs. When speaking to a local newspaper, one officer stated, quote, It's realistically difficult for police officers to separate any child from their parents without any guaranteed authority. Whether or not such a report would have actually resulted in these cops being fired is unclear, but you would hope that it would be disregarded given the undeniable proof of abuse. Now, of course, we are still not done here. The Child Protection Institution dropped the ball as well, and is in itself a complex and unruly entity. The CPI is managed by several nonprofit organizations, one of which is called Good Neighbors. Representatives from Good Neighbors accompanied police on field investigations for each report of Jung-in's suspected abuse, and on every occasion, they failed to recognize her as an abused child. It's hard to tell which issues come from lackluster training and which are down to their flawed evaluation process. Said evaluation process includes two items that require verbal answers from a child, and in the case of infants, who are nonverbal, these items are omitted rather than replaced with something useful. As you can imagine, this sort of thing leaves gaps in the findings for any kid too young to speak for themselves. So Good Neighbors was ineffective, but the other players involved in child welfare didn't seem to be much better, and a key component of the issue is that with several organizations involved, a lot gets lost in communication. According to Jian Lee, a lawyer and director of the Korea Child Care Promotion Institute, quote, the three agencies are unable to work together efficiently. When something like jong -in's case happens, they're too busy shifting the blame to each other. They have to decide who is in charge of each part of the case. But there are only 240 child abuse officials and over 30,000 cases reported. They're terribly understaffed. On account of the uproar, the South Korean Assembly hastily passed several new child protection laws, which included a ban on corporal punishment in the home, and required police to investigate a potential abuse situation immediately after being alerted by medical professionals or child welfare agencies. How well this is going to be enforced remains to be seen. Again, we could go on forever about the many, many organizations, institutions, and individuals who failed this child, but at the end of the day, this case just leaves you wondering why these people bothered adopting a kid at all. In the text I showed you earlier, they talked about this baby as if they despised her, and perhaps they did. Either way, it goes without saying that people like this really should not ever be allowed to be parents in the first place. This video was written and researched by Lux Noctis, edited by Darkfire Productions, with additional writing and research by yours truly.